Hello, it's just lovely to see you all again. Uh, here we are for another online lesson. Uh, just a reminder, key information is going to be in red. You may want to use this to make notes. Any additional information that may be in exam context will be in black. Any extra information beyond the specification um, is going to be in italics. We've got key questions down the left hand side and we've got the title and the subheadings uh, in purple at the top with the learning objectives right at the top all the way through format of the lesson we're going to start with our brain health going through the content and context of the lesson uh, we've got some quizzing we've got some exam practice and then a plenary and an opportunity for extended learning after that we're going to look after our physical health a little bit of activity to get your bodies moving and then right at the end a nice activity to help you look after your mental health so but before we start today um a couple of eagle-eyed physicists spotted some mistakes on last lesson's slide uh, on this slide at about 17 minutes in um, we have the wrong element it's not lead with an atomic number of 81 if we look at the periodic table we can see it's thallium so please can you um, adjust your notes um, if you've got this error in your notes from last lesson another mistake uh, was on this slide at about 25 minutes in um, we have the wrong atomic number for copper there so if you can change that to 29 for copper um, just to make sure that your notes are accurate the answer for nickel is correct but the atomic number for copper was incorrect so on to today's lesson um oh no <laughs> let's look at some notes from some of our physicists um if you're struggling to think how can these um like online lessons turn into notes in my book. Um, this is what some other students have done. I love this one because we've got the title in the center and then all of the information branching off. It's really nicely organized. This one is a great use of color, making everything stand out. Um, I love the fact that there are little bits of paper with some of the answers on that really makes it stand out. A really nice example of some eye-catching notes. This one I really like because it's very clear how it's divided. So this is something that would definitely stick in your mind when it comes to revision, uh, the different properties of each of these different radioactive particles and gamma rays. Um, you might be the kind of person who likes long extended notes. I love how neatly the subheadings are highlighted here. And we've got very distinct sections for each part of the lesson. So if you're the kind of person who likes long notes, um, you might want to do something similar to this. Or you may want to summarize everything into one page. I like this one because we've got, again, very clear headings. Um, and we've got lovely concise summaries. So it isn't all the information, it's some nice kind of chunky bits of information taken from the huge amount of information you get in these videos um, so it's up to you how you present your notes but these are some lovely examples of physicists who have sent them in um, if you want to send in your notes so i can have a look um, or feature them on one of these videos so other people can have an idea of what they want to do please please do drop me an email i love seeing um, how you guys have interpreted these lessons um, so now on to today's lesson uh, what is the link between Harry Potter and nuclear decay? Uh, you may be going along with a kind of quote from the first book, uh, linking to the title, to live a cursed life, a half-life, or whatever that quote is. Um, you're close, but not close enough. The correct book, but not the correct link. The link, weirdly enough, is the Philosopher's Stone. And this is kind of a legendary substance that ancient alchemists spent an awful lot of time and effort trying to discover or trying to make. Um, it has, you know, legendary properties of being able to extend life like it was used in Harry Potter, um, but also to be able to turn um, metals that are not very valuable into our precious metals like gold and silver and for a lot of alchemists these kind of early chemists um, they spent their life working towards it it was their magnum opus uh, their life's work um, but because it is kind of a legendary substance uh, by the early 1700s most scientists had kind of consigned it to history. It was, you know, a fable, something theoretical, but no reputable scientists were working on this. 
we skip forwards a couple of hundred years, um, Ernest Rutherford from our uh, timeline of the atom and Frederick Soddy were working with radioactive substances and they discovered that thorium, an isotope of thorium that was unstable, so a radioactive isotope of thorium, naturally changed into another element. And this was insane at the time. This was incredible. This was like a brand new discovery. And in reading Soddy's notes, he was so, so excited about this. And he yelled, Rutherford, this is transmutation. The thorium is disintegrating and transmuting itself into argon gas. And Rutherford's reply was, for Mike's sake, Soddy, don't call it transmutation. They'll have our heads off as alchemists. So the idea of being an alchemist um, still had a kind of negative um, idea attached to it. But this is what they had achieved. They had turned one element into another. We know this now is a result, that, as physicists, we know this is a result of nuclear decay. Um, but at the time, it was the first time it had been observed. And this sparked a whole load of interest in this area of um, changing one element into another of trans. Um, so, two scientists separately, um, Hantaro Nagaoka and Adolf Mitha, um, please let me know how to pronounce those, um, both separately managed to use um, like nuclear bombardment, I think it was, to obtain gold. Um, so they managed to turn a radioactive isotope of one element into an isotope of gold. Unfortunately, it was a radioactive isotope of gold, so not exactly the kind of thing you want to be making jewellery out of, but they managed it. Um, and this was a really exciting time for physics. Being able to change one element into another was something that previously was thought to be a legendary feat. So, we know now, you guys in school know that this is possible. This is like the frontier of physics a hundred years ago, but you guys know this now. Um, it's a result of nuclear decay. When an alpha or a beta particle is emitted from a nucleus, that changes the charge of the nucleus. When a proton or two protons are lost in alpha decay, then the atomic number decreases, the charge decreases. Or with beta decay, when one of those neutrons changes into a proton and an electron is emitted, that increases the charge by one. So we know that the charge, the atomic number, the proton number, whatever you want to call it, can change. The charge of the nucleus can change. And when the charge of that nucleus changes, that changes the element. It is no longer carbon-14 if it emits an electron, it is nitrogen-14. It's no longer uranium-238 if it emits an alpha particle, it is thorium-234. We can change these elements. Now, each one of these individual radioactive isotopes of all the elements have a specific amount of time um, over which they will emit these particles. Radiation or the emission of radioactive particles is a random event. We can't ever predict which particle is going to be, uh, sorry, which nucleus is going to decay, which nucleus is going to emit a alpha or a beta particle. We can't ever predict uh, when it's going to happen, but we can measure it and we can work out an average over time. We can assign this number to these radioisotopes. So let's look at beta to begin with. So carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years, give or take 40 years either side. This is a really nice example of uncertainty. Remember, uncertainty is calculated by taking the range of a set of results and dividing it by two. So the uncertainty is 40 years either way with carbon-14's half-life. But a half-life of 5,730 years means that this is the amount of time it takes for half of carbon-14's nuclei to emit a beta, uh, a beta particle. Um, so, let's say we've got a lump of carbon-14 here. After 5,730 years, give or take 40 years, out of this lump, half 
of these carbon-14 atoms will have emitted a beta particle. So that means this half will have become nitrogen-14. This is a simplified model. It's never going to be, you know, exactly this half here and this half there. It will be atoms throughout um, <laughs> this sample. But let's simplify it and say this half here are nitrogen-14. So this means that this half here is stable nitrogen-14. This half here is still radioactive carbon-14. So when one half-life has passed, when 5,730 years has passed, half of the atoms of carbon-14 have become nitrogen-14 atoms, which means only half of this sample is still radioactive. So the activity of this sample, the counts per minute, has halved as well, because only half of our original sample is still radioactive. If another 5,730 years pass, this is stable, this isn't emitting any beta particles, but over on this side, how much of this do you reckon will have decayed? How much of this do you think will have become nitrogen-14 atoms? Yeah, half of this again. So we've got a situation where when two half-lives have passed, three quarters in total of this carbon-14 radioisotope have decayed, they have emitted a beta particle, and they have become nitrogen-14. And only a quarter of the substance, or of the sample, is left still as radioactive carbon-14 atoms. So, because only a quarter of that original sample left is still radioactive, the activity of it drops by a quarter. Now this is absolutely perfectly fine when um, the isotope that carbon-14 decays into, when it, the isotope that it becomes is stable. We call um, the isotope that it decays into the daughter isotope. So when the daughter isotope is stable, activity will quarter. Um, looking at alpha decay though for uranium-238, um, we've got a little bit of a problem in describing activity. We can still describe the number of atoms or the number of nuclei perfectly, uh, but activity here is a little bit more tricky. So let's take a lump of uranium-238. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe to be holding it in my hands. As well as being an imaginary, it is an alpha emitter. So my skin is thick enough to protect me from the radiation. Um, we've got uranium-238. It has a half-life of 4.468 billion years. So if I were to stand here for 4.468 billion years, half of these atoms um, will no longer be uranium-238 atoms. Half of the nuclei will have emitted an alpha particle, which means half of them will have decayed and turned into thorium-234. So, when one half-life, one half-life, <laughs> one half-life has passed, um, half of the uranium-238 atoms have become thorium-234 atoms. But activity with unstable daughter isotopes is more difficult to describe. And this is because thorium is not stable. Thorium is a beta emitter. So after 4.46 billion years, half of that uranium has become thorium, but thorium only has a half-life of 24.1 days. So that thorium will decay into protactinium-234. And that protactinium-234 is another beta emitter with a half-life of 6.7 hours. So after 6.7 hours, this protactinium-234 will have decayed into another unstable isotope. It, funnily enough, decays into uranium-234, which is another alpha emitter. This alpha emitter has a half-life of 245,000 years. Um, so you can see the problem here. We haven't got a stable isotope. We've got a situation where after 4.468 billion years, this half here isn't just thorium. 
it continues to decay and it decays into um, this kind of chain of isotopes, all of which have different half-lives. So to say the activity has halved with unstable isotopes um, is, is a bit of a, uh, we, we couldn't, I couldn't certainly say for certain how the activity has changed because even beyond uranium-234, we've got another alpha emitter, thorium-230. So this decay chain continues all the way down to our stable isotope, to lead-206. Um, so by the time it gets its decay to lead-206, then we can say activity is decreasing, but the whole time it's decaying to unstable isotopes. It's hard to make that statement about activity. But we can say for certain that when one half-life has passed, half of the uranium-248 atoms have <laughs> become thorium-234 and then they've become something else and something else and something else. They are no longer uranium-238. When two half-lives have passed, three quarters of uranium-238 have decayed into thorium-234 and then decayed and decayed and decayed. Um, with activity and unstable isotopes, like I said, it's harder to say. Um, for GCSE AQA though, um, they will only ask you, hopefully, about stable uh, situations. Um, the reason I'm going into this much detail is AQA's definition of half-life. Um, this is straight from the spec. The half-life of a radioactive isotope is the time it takes for the number of nuclei of the isotope in a sample to half. We're okay with that. That is absolutely fine for all stable and unstable daughter isotopes. Um, or the time it takes for the count rate or the activity from a sample containing the isotope to fall to half its initial le level. Uh, as we discussed with the decay chain, this is providing it's a stable isotope. If it is a, an unstable daughter, daughter isotope, um, like we said, not quite so cut and dry. But we can definitely express um, how much of the initial radioactive isotope is remaining after each half-life in three different ways. We can express it as a fraction, uh, we can express it as a percentage, or if you're doing the higher tier paper, we can express it as net decline. This is a ratio. If zero half-lives have passed, we've got 100% of our isotope. One over one, a one-to-one -one ratio. After one half-life, we've got half the amount, a half, 50% or one to two, complete the rest of the table, going up to seven half-lives. Pause the video if you'd like some more time. So your table should look like this. Our numbers go one over one, one over two, one over four, one over eight, over 16, 32, 64, 128. Uh, that fraction getting smaller each time. Our percentages halving each time and our ratio 1 to 2, 1 to 4, 1 to 8, 1 to 16, getting bigger each time. So that amount, the amount of activity or the amount of the original atoms is getting smaller. Um, we can express this as a general formula. So this is beyond the spec. Um, to work out the fraction remaining, it's 1 over 2 to the power of the number of half-lives, 1 over 2 to the power of n. For the percentage, it's 100 over 2 to the power of n, 2 to the power of the number of half-lives. Uh, for the net decline, it's 1 to 2 to the power of n. Um, so 2 to the power of the number of half-lives. So if you wanted to work out uh, how much, what the, the percentage of the original isotope they would be after like 300 half-lives, you could work it out using these general formulas. If you want to have a little bit of practice and see how teeny tiny these numbers get, do feel free. Um, so, as well as expressing it as fractions or percentages or net decline, we can show it using a graph. And um, because it decreases by half each time, we can describe radioactive de decay as exponential. It decreases half, half, half. And this gives us, which way? There we go. <laughs> a lovely, smooth, curve. So we've starting at 100, I'm doing this the wrong way around, there we go. 
and we half and half and half until we get this lovely smooth curve. Um, this curve will never um, touch the y, uh, y axis, x axis, it will never um, intersect the x x axis because if you're halving each time uh, even if you get down to like one like half of one would be a half you'd never get down to zero so there's a nice little bit of maths uh, linking to exponential curves uh, we can also think about it in terms of numbers so uh, we've got 100 little red dots uh, in the next box there are 50 then 25 then I think that's rounded up to 30 and they get half halved and halved and halved each time. So there are lots of ways of thinking about radioactive decay. Um, but the awesome thing about it is it is random, completely random. We don't know which unstable nucleus is going to emit a radioactive particle. We've got no idea when it will emit a radioactive particle. If this one does, it doesn't mean that its neighbour is any more or less likely to. Um, the nature of radioactive decay is that it is random, um, but we can measure it over time and we can come up with these figures for half-life. Um, because it's random and because it's binary, it's either yes it decays or no it doesn't, we can do an awesome little experiment to model this. Um, ah, right after our cumulative quizzing. So here are two questions from last lesson's PowerPoint. Uh, this is so you can build stronger links between information that is vital to understanding this stuff that we're building on top. And also three new questions from this PowerPoint. Pause the video, have a go at the questions. And the answers. Uh, The answers. <laughs> um, so, how many initial radioactive atoms decay during one ice type, uh, one half life? Uh, a half, or fifty percent, or a half? Uh, quantities reduced by half during one half life. The number of nuclei, or the activity of the sample. Um, nature of radioactive decay is that it is random. Ha! Ah, there we go. Whew, I thought my PowerPoint had broken then. Um, so we are on to the practical. This is a lovely practical. You need 100 coins. Um, if you can get them exactly the same, that's brilliant. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, these are from my lucky pot. Um, I play a ridiculous game, which is any coins that I find, um, I pick them up and I put them in a pot and I see at the end of the year how, how many coins I've found. So these are all the two things I found in 2019. Um, you also need an extra pile um, because um, when we do this practical, there is a chance that some of them will be um, heads all the way through. So these are our, our extra head uh, coin pile. So, you are going to annoy the people in your household and shake this up. And that is the equivalent of us tossing 100 coins in one go. We're going to turn them out onto a surface. And then... can't see if you can see me. Any which are heads, we are going to stack up. So, so I've got 60 coins for my first half-life. So this means that these are the remaining isotope. So because I want this pile here for my graph, I'm going to have to add 10 extra coins from my pile here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. No, 20 coins. Oh, no. I'm going to have to break out my one piece. 20 extra coins from this pile to make sure that I've still got 60 left because I've got 60 um, unstable, isot uh, unstable atoms which haven't decayed here. This is the number that needs to go back in my pot but I want this pile to stay here.
Okay, I found some more two peas. We're going for half life number two. Okay. That means I have 30. So I need 30 to go back in. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Exactly 30. Don't know why I need to count that. Half life number three. This time I've got 17, which means that I need 17 to half life number four. So this time I've got six, so that means I need six to go back in. At the moment I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So three need to come out, six remaining, one, two, oh no, I've got two, <laughs> one, it's heads, put that there, need a bigger bit of Tupperware. But you can see you've got this lovely curve. So if you guys want to have a go at this at home, feel free. Um, a really nice extension um, beyond this is um, you could double the amount of coins if you have a very large change pot, see if this changes the shape of your graph, or you can use a stopwatch to time each half-life. Uh, this would involve plotting multiple graphs um, on the same sheet of paper. So Rutherfordium 261 has a half-life of 81 seconds. If you start it, and then after 81 seconds, shake up the pot, make your pile. After another 81 seconds, make your second pile and plot these on a graph. You can do this with the same, um, on the same graph, um, with Mercury 210, so every 10 minutes, um, tip out the pot, count how many there are. And you should find that Rutherfordium has got a very kind of steep curve. Um, Mercury will take longer. Have a compare, uh, have a compare. Uh, compare to Nobelium 259, uh, which has a half-life of roughly an hour. Um, would the shape of these change, or is it just how quickly they form? Is it just um, the kind of gradient of the curve that's changing? Um, let me move these before they fall. So, we know the nature of radioactive decay is that it's random. We can never predict which nucleus is going to emit a radioactive particle, but we do know through um, years and years of loads and loads of scientists measuring the activity of each of these individual isotopes of each of these radioactive substances, so all of the known radioisotopes of each element, um, we know the half-life of all of them. Um, and this is really useful to allow us to predict future activity of substances or to work backwards and predict how active they were in the past. So, for example, um, 33 years ago, uh, on the 26th of April, um, reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear facility in Ukraine went into meltdown and exploded, and over 100 different radioactive elements were released into the atmosphere. Um, three of them were 
particularly concerning. Iodine 131 um, is not a very nice radioisotope. It accumulates in the thyroid gland and can cause thyroid cancers. But because it's only got a half-life of eight days, the risk was um, mainly people in the immediate area, people who were there at that time. Over time, because it's got such a short half-life, its activity decreased rapidly. Two other elements, though, with a longer half-life are strontium-90 and cesium-137. Uh, strontium-90 has a half-life of 29 years, and cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years. And they haven't decreased in activity as fast because their half-life is so much longer. Um, so this was 34 years ago, 33, 34 years ago, 33, almost 34, um, so we've only just passed one half-life for each of these, uh, for strontium-90 and for cesium-137. So that means that they've only just reduced um, by half, like half of those strontium um, atoms have decayed, half of those cesium-137 atoms have decayed. Um, so in working out how long it will take this links to your half-life skill as well how long would it take for um, a certain number of half-lives to pass so for example we talked about iodine 131 having a half-life of eight days so after one half-life eight days will have passed it will be at half its activity 50 percent of those atoms will be re remaining um after two half-lives 16 days will have passed so work out how long it would take for seven half-lives to have passed for the activity of iodine to reduce down to less than one percent of the original activity or for the number of atoms to reduce to less than one percent of the original iodine 131 atoms um for strontium and cesium as well we said they've got much longer half-life in years 29 and 30 work out how long they would take to reduce in activity and the answers so for strontium 90 and for cesium uh, 137 to get to below one percent of the original number of radioactive isotopes that there were in that sample it would take almost 2000 years um as i said we are at the moment um yeah 33 34 years uh we're, we're somewhere between one and two half-lives uh, which means that the amount, well, the the number of um, strontium and cesium atoms there are between 50 and 25 percent. Um, so it hasn't decreased by a huge amount um, yet. So using our skills in a different way, um, thinking about standard form, being able to convert to and from standard form is a one mark kind of skill. Uh, have a go at converting these numbers in the table and then using these numbers calculate how many half-lives would pass for an isotope to reduce an activity to 1 over 64 then using the numbers for number two and three uh, question number four is a higher tier kind of question uh, so pause the video have a go so six half-lives will have passed to reduce to one over 64. We've got one half-life a half, two a quarter, three one over eight, four one over 16, five one over 32, six half-lives one over 64. Um, to work out how long it would take a sample of uranium-238 to reduce to 25%, so we've got one half-life 50%, two half-lives 25%. If we times those two half-lives, by how long it takes, reading off the table, we get 45 million billion years times two uh, gives us 90 billion years. Um, working out which sample would take 20.8 million years to decay to 1 16th. So 1 16th is four half-lives. Uh, so one half-life would have passed for 20.8 million to decay to 10.4, two half-lives 10.4 to 5.2, uh, three half-lives 5.2 million 
to decay to 2.6 million and then four half-lives 2.6 million will decay to 1.3 million we can look that up on the table that gives us potassium 40. um initial count of 815 down to 51 so this is our net count our higher tier question so if one half-life has passed 816 will drop to 408 if two half-lives have passed 408 will drop to 204 if three half-lives have passed 204 will drop to 102 if four half-lives have passed 102 will drop to 51 so a count a dropping count from 816 to 51 would be four half-lives um expressing this as a ratio we could do 51 to 816 or we could simplify it to 1 to 16. So we can also work out half-life using graphs. This graph here shows potassium 40, which is our radioactive isotope, decaying into argon 40. So which um, radioactive particle is being emitted for potassium 40 to decay into argon 40? You're right, it's a beta particle because the mass hasn't changed, but potassium and argon have different atomic numbers. The atomic number has reduced by one, so potassium has turned into argon. Um, so you can see that for potassium 40, we've got relative number of atoms. They seem to be doing this as a percentage, so 100% of the number of atoms, and it's decreasing. So to find the half-life, half of 100 is 50. So we read across from 50, and then go down to the x-axis. So for this example, potassium 40, we've got a half-life of 1.3 million years. Don't get caught out by this. Oh, sorry, 1.3. 1 1.3 thousand million years. Um, so have a look just here. Time in millions of years. Don't be caught out by the labels on the axes. Um, another example. So this uh, graph, we haven't got it starting at 100%. We've got 100,000. Half of 100,000 is 50,000. So again, we find half, read across, and go down. So this is an unknown isotope. It's not labelled, and time hasn't got a unit. Um, but we can see that it crosses the x-axis around about three and a half. So we can say 3.5 unit time. Um, and that's a perfectly acceptable way of answering this question where not all the information is given. So let's have a go at some past paper exam questions. Uh, table three shows the half-lives of two radioactive isotopes, uh, cesium-137 and iodine-131. Where have we seen these? Uh, in a soil sample taken from the area around Chernobyl, in 1986. Um, it was contaminated with equal amounts of cesium-137 and iodine-131. Explain how the risk linked to each isotope has changed between 1986 and 2018. Both isotopes emit the same kind of radiation. So the risk isn't associated with the type of radiation they emit, it's to do with the amount of them left. Pause the video, have a go at answering the question. Four marks. So one mark for saying the risk associated with iodine-131 has decreased by a large amount because it's got a short half-life. Two marks there. For cesium-137, the risk hasn't decreased as much. Um, the activity has halved. You can have a point for saying that um, because one half-life has passed, but it hasn't decreased as much as iodine because it's got a much longer half-life. Um, so two marks there. Looking at the same table again, determine the year when the activity of cesium-137 will be 1 over 32 of its original value. Um, okay, so working out how many half-lives will need to pass to get to 1 over 32, and then work out what that is in terms of the year. Pause the question, have a go. So for this, it's up to you how you work out half-life. Um, AQA do it by a half times a half times a half times a half. Um, I like to do it a half, a quarter, a, an eighth, one over 16, one over 32, 
is five half lives. Maths is very personal, however you like to work it out is up to you. So we've got five half lives. Looking at the table, each half life is 30 years. So five times 30 years gives us 150 years, but they don't wanna know just 150 years, they wanna know how long, what year will it be? So from 1986, 150 years in the future, that gives us the year 2136. So three marks there. Make sure you don't get caught out on losing that last mark by not giving the year. So another question, two isotopes of carbon, a carbon 12 and carbon 14. Two similarities and one difference in the atomic structure. Okay, so refer to the number of subatomic particles and refer to the type of subatomic particles in each isotope. Two similarities, one difference. And the answers. Similarities, both will have six electrons because they both got six protons. They are carbon. Carbon has six protons, so it will have six electrons if it's an atom. Um, the difference is carbon-12 has six neutrons. Carbon-12, uh, carbon-14 has eight neutrons. You can say carbon-14 has got two more neutrons, and um, that would be absolutely fine. Three marks available there. C14, carbon-14, is a radioactive isotope with a half-life of 5,730 years. Um, a sample from a fossilised tree gives a count rate of 20 decays per second. The tree died 17,190 years ago. Determine the count rate of the isotope when the tree died. What a good question. Okay, so we've got some key numbers here. We've got the tree died 17,190 years ago, and we've got a half-life of 5,730. How many half-lives have passed if... It's 20 decays per second now. It would have been twice as active one half-life ago and double that two half-lives ago. Pause the video, work out the answer. Okay, so if we divide 17,190 by 5,730, we get three half-lives. So this means if it's 20 now, double that one half-life ago, it would have been 40. Double that again, two half-lives ago, it would have been 80. Double that again, three half-lives ago, it would have been 160. A count of 160 when the tree died. Nice question. Okay, we're on to a graph. A sample of cobalt 60 changes over time. So the initial activity, uh, we can see where it's crossing the y-axis, and then we've got that lovely exponential curve. So determine the half-life of cobalt-60, cool. Okay, so looking at the original activity, it's not hugely clear, but to me it looks to be around 11,000. Pause the video, show you working on the graph if you've printed it off, or do a quick sketch in your book. And the answer, so if we've got an initial activity of 11,000, if we go down to 5,500, move across to the line and down to the x-axis, we can see that the half-life is about five years. Now with graph questions, there is a margin of error. So you can have anything from between 5,300 to 5,600, which will mean that if you read across and read down, it will be somewhere between 4.9 and 5.1. So turn this lesson into a mind map. Uh, summarise it in any way you like, make it a little bit more visual. Um, we've got <laughs> a lovely load of information about half-life. So, extended learning. Um, some of the physics graphs that I was looking, that I was looking for on the internet um, weren't great, but a really lovely place that I found loads to practice on is the physics aviary. If you click on this link, um, down in the, the comments, uh, it'll take you to a page where you can have a go at one graph and it'll give you the answer, tell you if you're right or wrong, and then you can press it again and it'll give you a completely different graph. Uh, so it's a really nice place to, to practice working out half-life from graphs. There's also some really nice games on there. Um, so have an investigate, see what you think of the physics aviary. Uh, on to a bit of activity now. We're gonna do some strength training today, so make sure you're wearing comfortable clothing. Uh, 
Okay, don't worry, it's just body weight. We're not going to break out the heavy weights. Um, so, to begin with, we are going to warm up. Ooh, let's bring that forward again. There we go. So, to begin with, we're just going to do some lunges. Mo lunging forwards. Keep your knee above your ankle and try and bring that back knee down to the ground. This is going to warm up all the big joints in your body, get them moving and get some blood moving to your legs. We're going to do three uh, sets today. I'm going to run you through the first set and then if you like you can do an additional two sets just to get the most out of this activity. I always lose count. Say one more each side. There we go. I'm going to move into some squats. So feet shoulder width apart. Squat down. And then drive up. Try and keep the weight in your heels. Heels firmly planted on the floor. Hopefully your heart rate should start raising by now. Mine is. Two more. Whew. And then we're going to do some stepping back, raising our arms. So, one leg moving behind, drop the knee to the ground, but don't smash it into the ground because that hurts. Whew. One more each leg. One, two. Okay, so today we're going to need um, a, a, a surface which is um, roughly, I'll take my shoes off as it's a silver. When you put your leg on it, your leg is roughly or your knee is bent at roughly a right angle. Um, so, exercise number one, we're just gonna step up and bring our foot gently back down, just like this. Try and keep the tension in your front leg. Ooh, and try and keep your balance. So, we'll do 12. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and the other leg. One, two, three, four, five. Exercise number two, we're going to put one foot on our ledge, try and keep the hinge point of your ankle on the edge, you're going to hop oops, the other foot forwards, and we're going to lunge down on one leg. These are Bulgarian split squats. I always like to hold my own hand, because they hurt. Four, <laughs> five, twelve again. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and the other leg. quads. Okay, exercise number three. We're going to do single leg 
hip thrusts. So, using our surface again, you get your shoulders on the surface and raise your legs up so there's a right angle between your knees and your thighs. You're going to raise one leg, dip down and back up. Twelve of these. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ow, ten, eleven, twelve, Whew. and the other leg. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Blimey. So, oh. if you guys want to do two more sets, I'm going to call it a day there. Um, <laughs> last bit, a bit of mindfulness. Um, Coursera has a, an amazing range of courses. Some are free, some you have to pay for. Um, but two free ones that I thought might be nice uh, for a bit of investigation, a bit of investigation is uh, the Science of Wellbeing. This is a Yale course, one of the most pre prestigious universities whew, in America. Uh, so you can sign up for the Science of Wellbeing, that's a really nice course. Um, mindfulness is also a free course, but there's a huge range of free courses on there. Uh, the only problem is because so many people have become interested in Coursera, uh, at 9 o'clock tonight they're taking their site down for a bit of maintenance, but it should be up and running tomorrow. So if you want to sign up before 9 o'clock tonight, uh, just to you know, have a look, feel free. Um, but if it stops working later on, it's because they've had to take it down uh, for a little bit of maintenance. Um, 9 o'clock tonight, tonight is uh, the 2nd of April. Uh, so if you're watching this after the 2nd of April, you're all good. Um, so thank you for watching uh, this video. Um, if there are any mistakes or if there's anything I can do better, please let me know. Uh, I want these to be as useful as possible. But I'll see you guys when I see you. Be awesome. Do awesome things.